Hello everyone and welcome to Be My Guest with me, Mary Honan, on Lear Media TV, supporting the Samaritans, Limerick and Tipperary. And my very special guest today, oh God, we had so much difficulty trying to get on the internet, <laughs> is wonderful until it isn't technology, is Father Gabriel Burke. And uh, Father, is uh, in, in, you're in Cork, aren't you, Father? Yep, the parish of Blarney. I'm in the white church part of Blarney. Wow. Blarney is lovely. So, absolutely. But I've never kissed the Blarney stone. <laughs> You don't need it. I don't think there's anyone in Ireland that actually ever needs to kiss the Blarney Stone. <laughs> I think it's just built into our genes. Absolutely. <laughs> tell me, Father, uh, tell me your story. How did you... Am I right in thinking that you became... You were a late vocation? Yeah, I was ordained at the age of 30, which yes, I suppose yes. nowadays wouldn't be considered late, but at my oh. time would have been considered because most fellows were ordained about 25. Yeah. Whereas I went, I didn't go into the seminary till I was 20. And then um, I had been working for a few years. I worked in the VHI in Dublin. Yeah. yeah. And then um, I went to Thurla Seminary and I was ordained for the Diocese of Cloyne. So now you have three dubs in Cork. You've got two priests in Cloyne who are dub, and they are and the Bishop of Cork, which yeah. is our next door diocese, is um, a dub, and we, he was actually in seminary with me when uh, when I went into seminary first in Dublin. Um, and so then I was sent to my first thirteen years. I was cured in McCroom, and I was also a teacher in the VC school there. And then after McCroom, I went to Carrick Tool for four years. And then I was in Mitchellstown for four years. And then last year I was I came here to Whitechurch. Well, my friend, my friend, um, she's from, um, Be uh, Be uh, uh, she's near Mitchellstown, um, uh, Farrelly, Mon Monaghan, um, oh, Monaghan yeah. Transport. But um, she's from near Mitchellstown, but, um, and I've been there quite, quite often but it's a lovely um, it's a lovely part of Ireland do you like it there now it is yep I mean I've been very lucky yeah. every parish yeah. I've ever been in I've loved it yeah and I've always got on wherever I've been sent I've always found the people absolutely wonderful yeah now this is my first taste really at being in a rural area because what we have here is a, a couple of housing estates about two or three a pub a chapel a garage and a shop and a school and a community centre and that's it. And all of them are closed right now. More the shop is open, yeah, because it, it sells essentials. How are you coping with um, both as a priest and as a, as a human being? Do you know, well, with I'm one of the I'm one of the high risk, so I've been basically semi-cocooning. But I still go up to the church every day and say Mass. And if I get a call out, I'll get a call out, I'll go. I hear confessions every Saturday. I have a screen and six foot on either side, so there's no problem. I think once you follow the procedures, the protocols, there's no problem. Mm. I mean, I've been on dialysis now for four years. And so oh, really? I'm used to, yeah, so I'm used to rubbing my hands all the time with um, sanitizers and all that. I haven't had a cold or a flu in four years. And tell in me- that length of time. Tell me, Father, are you on dialysis because you're not bad enough for um, to have the kidney oh, I'm on, transplant? Or? I'm, on the, I'm on the list. I'm on the transplant list. But I've been on um, dialysis now for four years. I do what they call peritonoidal. So can, I do it every night in my own house, and it goes into the belly. Uh, glucose is put in, and every... So it lasts for about 10 hours. And I go yeah. through six cycles. Yeah, and that's then, relatively new, isn't it? Um, compared to um, compared to yeah, I mean, there's there's not that in. many of us on it. Yeah, I mean, there are plenty of people going into the hospitals to do the um, dialysis there, but there's not many of us do home dialysis. Yeah, my cousin and his mother both um, had kidney transplants, and um, yeah. and he his was his is hugely successful. You know. And um, so, and you just have to wait, is it? That's oh. it. 
just have to until wait. they get a match now you see even though i come from a large family none of them are. The, none of them are matched they're all uh i'm 53 my eldest brother is 69 but all of them go down the list they're all diabetics you're uh, kidding. And is that, uh, yeah. and you're not? Not yet. I suppose eventually when I get to be as old as them. <laughs> but that comes from my father's side of the family. Wow. All his, all his family had it. Um, but you'd nearly be showing signs, you'd nearly be showing signs surely now of diabetes. From, if you, if yeah. You were. If it, no, all my, all my sugar levels are fine. Yeah. But it seems to hit them in the 60s. Wow, isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all on the on the male side, so they would definitely not be um, suitable. No, they're not. They've, they've even, been... if they, even if they were compatible, um, yeah. In, in other ways, they, they, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, amazing. because one of the one of the first things to go when you've got diabetes, one of the first problems you have is with the kidneys. Kidneys, I know. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's that's it. But sure, listen. God has given me a wonderful gift. That's the way I look at it, and that I can use it for a sacrifice for myself and for those around me, and that it's a great way to remind us that I'm not in charge, God is. You know, the church has gone through, I suppose, such a, in many respects, unjustified um, um, uh, slating from people, you know, sometimes, in some cases, absolutely justified. Mm -hmm. um, as, as, as I was saying to you off camera, I've come, I suppose I've come from a mixed, my father's side of the family, we're all Protestants, Welsh Methodist. <laughs> my great, great, great grandmother was Jewish and the line kind of changed when she married a uh, Protestant. And my mother was strict Catholic. And so I was right. brought up Catholic. So I, I would, I love my faith. I love my religion and that, and yes, there have been times, I suppose, with my parents' deaths that I've found it challenging and you, you start to blame God when, in actual fact, um, it should be bringing you closer in some way, but it didn't. It brought me away, I suppose, from the church for a while. But it, there's always that pull. There's, for me, there's always that pull. And I find it even more, more the, the pull even stronger now since the doors have actually closed, if you like. Yeah. I, my parish church is St. John's Cathedral. You're allowed... Limerick. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, what is it, 20 people inside in St. that could fit a thousand? Yeah. Do you know, but yet you're allowed... That's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's just nonsense. But do you think that, like me, I mean... That I mean, I I used to go to mass every single day, and then I stopped going to mass, and then I and but all the time I had this guilt that I wasn't going. Do you think that the fact that doors are locked to people now that there are people around who are saying to themselves, I actually miss having the doors open and knowing if I want to go in, I can actually go in there. It's now you know I might go in. But it's, yeah. it's there if I want to, but now you can't. Is it, it in some ways it's bringing people, making people want to come back or yeah, want I to think, come to church? Yeah, what we look at is the numbers online. Yeah. And I mean, even for our parish, the numbers online for daily mass are, at the end of the month, there's over 8,000 people have tuned in. Isn't that to amazing? Mass. Now, Never would we get that many inside the, inside the weekly mass and the thing. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, you see, because you see, what I'm always telling people is that, okay, the media and RT in Ireland are probably anti-Catholic. Yes. But the vast majority of people are not. No. And the, the vast majority of people are just indifferent. Aren't yeah. You? They're just indifferent. God doesn't come into the equation. But at the same time, they're not anti-God. You know, no, at the I... end of the day, you know, there are 7,000, just under 8,000 self-confessed atheists in this country. That's right, yeah. The biggest number in this country is 460,000 no religion. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't believe in God. No, 
No, it just means that they're you know, like, it they're just like, means or, or, they, or yeah. they just don't follow a teachings. And as much as, you know, the atheists like to think that they are somehow rational and all that, they will never be much bigger than seven to 8,000 people. Because inherent in everybody is this kind of knowledge that there is a God. And I mean, I noticed it last week when they were talking about the, what used to be called the VC, but are the ETBs now, changing the statues and that in the schools. Yeah. Loads of atheists were going, you know, were on the thing, oh yeah, they're fairy tale. Until I pointed out to one, I said, you know, that your problem is, for you as an atheist, is that not only will it be my fairy tale as a Catholic in these things, so they'll put up a crib at Christmas, but it'll be the fairy tale of the Jews, so they'll put up in a men menorah at menorah. Passover. Yeah. I said it'll be the fairy tale of the Muslims, so Haid or something like that, they'll put up some symbol. I said, they're multi-faith, I said, not secular schools, so that they will be catering for everybody's fairy tale, as you called it, except for the atheist fairy tale. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know if there's any truth in the saying, but there's no atheists in foxholes. And, yeah. and you know, I mean, I, I mean, as I say, I can only speak personally. I mean, you, you, you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray that somebody is going to live and that you, you because my parents were wiped out very shortly after each other. Mom was diagnosed and, she lost her voice the night dad died right. and um, she, within a few days she was diagnosed and she died the same day as him the following year. So it really challenged me, challenged my faith. But all the time I, mm -hmm. I believed, all the time I was angry with, with an entity that I believed existed but I didn't want anything to do with, or I felt yeah. had actually done this to me and what had I done wrong. And, but now since the gates have closed, I'm, I find myself thinking, God, if only the doors were open, how many people would actually choose to go in there, even if, if only for a while. But, but do, do you see what you, you said there about getting angry? Yeah. Who do we normally get angry with? The closest person. The ones that are closest to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you're talking about yeah. is an absolutely wonderful relationship with God. I remember the story of, told of uh, the priest coming to bring Holy Communion to a, a, an elderly woman on the first Friday. And there was, as traditionally, the Immaculate Heart and the Sacred Heart pictures up. Yeah. And he looked up at the Sacred Heart picture and she said to him, you need even bother talking to him. I'm not talking to him at the moment. <laughs> Yeah. That's yeah. a wonderful thing. Yeah. My, I, I, I'm going. You know, I, my, my mother was so devout, absolutely so devout. But if she couldn't find her keys, the names she used to call Saint Anthony. She used to go around. She'd be going around the house. Saint Anthony, find them for me. And she'd be going around and she'd say, Saint Anthony, you. And she'd call him, you know, a name. And 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 then she'd say, I'm sorry, Saint Anthony. And she'd find them, you know. And she'd say, I'm really. And she'd go around. And I'd say, Who are you talking to? And she'd say, Anthony. And she'd walk. <laughs> I knew she was talking to Saint Anthony. She, you know, I mean, it, it sounded bizarre, but you know, I grew up with that, hearing my mother talking to this. As if he was inside the room with her, and she, exactly. you know, and and I, I remember, uh, I remember one time having a, 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 going on a date with a guy who was Church of Ireland, and Mum, as he was going out the door, she sprinkled holy water on him, and he said, "Mrs. Honan, I'm Church of Ireland." She said, "Never mind, you might need it more." <laughs> she sprinkled <laughs> water on him, and he loved her. Do you know? She just never mind, you might need it more. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and uh, and there was no harm in her, and and you know, and she was totally without prejudice about anyone, yeah. and, you know. And I grew up with that, which leads me on to the next question: anti-Semitism and 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 uh, xenophobia of all types. You and I are both um, um, Judeo Christians, Judeo Christians, and and pro is pro Israel. But I mean, I would say that for me, I'm pro Israel, but I'm also pro peace in Palestine for the Palestinian people. I want I want um, there to be peace 
which I think is happening, is starting to happen now with relations yeah. with Arab countries, um, uh, getting building bridges with with Israel and and peace in the Middle East. And I think only dialogue will bring about peace. Um, and not, that's what's happening at the moment. Not. Uh, not saying as I did with, with, with God, I don't want anything to do with you. Mm -hmm. I'd, um, you're, the only way is to actually fight with somebody, to actually fight discursively with somebody rather yep. than fight militarily. But, um, how do you feel about it, Father? You were I mean, when you think about a it. Christian Zionist. Yeah, I remember <laughs> seeing on some traditionalist website, I didn't even know what a Christian Zionist was. But look, when There's you look at it thing. this way, look, at the great gift that God has given, that these people, like the Irish, who had their land occupied for hundreds of years, I mean, they had their land occupied for over a thousand years. Yeah, over a thousand. I mean, the, what, what I tell to people is, I want to put it into a context of, that they'd understand. So I tell them that the Arabs are the Brits of the Levant, the Levant being Israel, Palestine, Jordan, up into Syria. And that the Arabs didn't enter into those places until about the 8th century. So that before that, they were never. So you look at Egypt. Who are the original Egyptians? The Coptic Christians. Sure, isn't that how they discovered what all those little symbols were in the pyramids? The Coptic words match them. Okay. And that's how they were able to decipher the hieroglyphics. hieroglyphics yeah. So they are, the, they are the original people of Egypt. The original people of North Africa, of Tunisia, of uh, Algeria, are like St. Augustine. They're Berbers. They're still there, but That's they're right. minorities Berber. in their own culture. Yeah. Mm. And then when you go across from Egypt into the Levant proper, the Christians that are there in Assyria and in Iraq and in Lebanon are not as some people incorrectly call them, Christian Arabs. They're not. They're there before the Arabs. I mean, the people, the Christians of Syria and, the, and to a lesser extent in Lebanon, they speak Syriac, which is Aramaic, the same language that that's our Lord right. spoke. Right. That, that, you know? And apparently that's the language that Jesus would have spoken was Aramaic. Exactly. I mean, there are whole villages in Syria where the first language is Aramaic. Yeah. And so then when you look down towards Israel, the Christians that are there, even though they are now today, people say, oh, Christian Arabs, they're not. They're people who were the first community of Jews that converted to Christianity after the resurrection. They're the families that were at the Council of Jerusalem in 60 AD or whenever it was. They've been there that long. And the Jewish people and the Samaritan people have always been on those lands. But because of different leaders, the Jews weren't allowed to go to their own homeland. Could you imagine if the British had said, well, now nobody can go, no Irishman can be in Ireland. Yeah. Like Cromwell tried to do and move us, like Cromwell tried to do, move us all out of the country. And that's what happened over time. And then what happened was that the Jews started to come back at the late 19th centuries. Yes. The 19th century, early 20th century, even before the Holocaust. Yes. They started moving back. And, you know, the Irish nationalists of the early 20th century understood the Jewish people because we saw ourselves in similar situation. People who had, let's face it, there are only two diasporas we ever talk about. The Jewish diaspora and, and the Irish diaspora. The Irish diaspora. So we understand that we have more people outside our native our countries than we have inside. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. We have so we should have that. million Americans. We should, as a nation, I always say this, as an Irish nation, we should have a, a very strong affiliation. And when I look back on my research, say, into literature on childhood under Nazism, and I, I'm shocked to actually realize that the likes of um, uh, Oliver J. Flanagan and uh, uh, Charles Bewley and people like that did everything in their power to prevent 500 Jewish children from yeah. coming into this country. At the same time, 
they had they they protected people like uh, uh um like uh Otto Skarseni and Artikovic and Peter Menton and um people like that you know that 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 they were known and notorious Nazis and you wonder why they didn't align themselves with people who were always in diaspora, it, the same as the Irish have been always in diaspora. Um, there have been one or two. Uh, the vast majority of people in Ireland wouldn't be anti-Semitic. No, you do have no, no, the no, no. Odd, odd element of it that comes about every now and then. But, but nowadays we will find a greater. Oliver J. Flanagan was elected on an anti-Semitic ticket. He was. And, 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 yeah, yeah. and it says a lot about the involvement, say, of, with respect, the Catholic Church as well was so strong in, 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 in Ireland in the 19th century. How, how involved or how much, of a, a contra, how much of a connection was that? Was there, you know... Well, I mean, look at my own school. I went to the Christian Brothers in Sing Street. Yeah. And we have the dubious pleasure of having two presidents. That's right. The first is the president of Ireland. And Herzog. Um, and then President Herzog. And that a Christian brother school, a Catholic boy school, had plenty of places and had their, for instance, at that time, um, like when my eldest brother was in school, they were in school on a Saturday. But the Jewish boys never had to be in school on a Saturday. Because it was the Sabbath. And they went, yeah, and they went home. They were let off early on a Friday so that they'd get home before the darkness. You know, so... Isn't that almost have... the reason to convert if you thought yeah. to get up on a Saturday? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'd say, though, they had to make up for some day during the week. <laughs> but it is, it is interesting that you have that... Like, my grandmother... Um, used to go around to her neighbours while they were in the synagogue and she would light their fires. Yeah. Because, of course, they couldn't light fires because it was That's against right. the, the Sabbath rules. So she used to light fires. And you had a lot of Dublin, you had a lot... Now, I, where I grew up in Dublin... people in Dublin, in Dublin did County, that, Dublin. went around lighting yeah. fires yeah. for their, their Jewish name. And I mean, where I lived in Dublin, I live in South County Dublin, well, South County now is an actual thing, but in South Dublin. So I grew up in a fairly mixed area. For every Catholic parish, you have a Church of Ireland parish. You, I grew up with um, all sorts of different shades of Protestantism, but also I grew up near the synagogue. Yeah. And so there's a rich worked, tapestry of faith absolutely. around you. And I used to love seeing on a Saturday morning, because I worked in a bakery just around the corner from the... I started work at the age of 13 in a bakery part-time, just around the corner from the synagogue. You progressed and to so the you see, Yeah, yeah. And you see all these kids, all these Jewish people, families going up, beautifully dressed. Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous. And it was a lesson on how to approach the sacred, that they would be in their best clothes and they were going together as, you know into the house of God, dressed but, up beautifully. Didn't we do that as Catholics also, no matter how poor people were, their yeah. best clothes were always kept for Sunday. When yeah, they could I had wear my, their best clothes going to Mass. Absolutely. And then stand at the back of the church and watch everyone going in and, yeah. <laughs> and giving, giving out about what they're wearing. <laughs> I mean, I always had a set of Sunday clothes. Yeah. Always. And... Um, that was just the norm. Everybody did that. Um, now, you see, I remember being in Boston. I served in, believe it or not, in a church called St. Gabriel's. And oh. I was just looking down and it was interesting to see because the Chinese women that were in it and the Chinese families that would come to Mass, beautifully dressed. The women would have these beautiful lace mantellas. The black women would come in and my God, they were beautiful hats beautiful and beautiful hats clothes. And, and they were and they were actually from the poorest section of the parish. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's all a respect for the, yeah. for the and in for came the, then the Irish the, and the Italians of, of Irish descent and Italian descent in shorts and in sleeveless shirts and looking like complete and utter absolute I don't know what you would call them, hobos. 
but um, <laughs> the, you know, shorts and flip flops and everything. You'd say to yourself, "Look at the way these poor people are dressed." Yeah. And how beautifully yeah. they're dressed. And they were the poor ones. And here were the because by that stage now the Irish had moved up, and the Italians had moved up, and they were now the middle classes. Yeah, yeah. But it is an interesting thing that how we have gone, you know, from that to very casual. We've gone very, yeah, we've gone very casual, not, I think, not just in our dress, but in our approach to our faith. And when you look yeah. at other, you look at other faiths around the, 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 you look at Islam, you look at Judaism, you look at, um, all the other religions around a friend of mine here who was, uh, he was a, pre a way to be a priest, he became a Baha'i. And you look at the way he approaches his religion and, um, and, how, uh, and, and the respect and reverence he has, say, for his belief. Um, and, um, and you wonder why it is that something that was so hard to come by in this country, so hard to protect in this country, when we had, um, when we had people going to hedge schools and we had people trying to hide their, their, religious, their religion and hide the fact that they were Catholic. People who died for their faith and suddenly it's just, it's at every, I, I, you know, lately I've taken now to actually unfriending people that I actually find saying the most vile things about mm -hmm. generalization of, I, whatever religion, because I yeah. don't like generalizations. I'm part of the Catholic Church, and when you ridicule the Catholic Church as a, as a, a group, and you say, oh, you know, Catholics are A, B, and C, you're ridiculing me, and I haven't done anything, or you haven't done anything, Father, but, so it, it's quite, it, it's, I can't understand why people can't say, a minority within the Catholic Church did this and um, in a global church of over a billion people did this yeah. and why should the whole church be stigmatized because of the it's actions? Pure. It's, it's, well first of all it's to a certain extent there's a lot of things going on in Ireland that you know Ireland is like a teenager you know teenagers like to rebel against everything and I, you know, in other countries, you don't have this thing of people coming to the sacraments who do not practice at all. So for instance, I spend a lot of time in France. You would never have a child in France who if the parents didn't go to mass, that they would be making their first communion or even a baptism, you know? Because in Ireland, you have this thing called cultural Catholicism. Yeah. Where people think that just because they're Irish, they're also Catholic. And I mean, I've seen people on the internet write down, oh, I am a practicing Catholic. And they've never been inside the ch church door since yeah. Noah was in the ark. But that's <laughs> because that's not their understanding. Yeah, but, in, but they, they, they identify as a culture. They identify. Culture yeah. Catholic. They were brought into this world. It's... When I was interviewing Dr. Helena Ganner, who wrote four letters to the witness of my childhood, she's a psychiatrist, a, no, she was a doctor w when she grew up, but she spent most of uh, the war in hiding. And, um, uh, and she was hidden by a Polish prostitute, by a Jewish um, doctor, by a, a Nazi who actually mm -hmm. hided or hid or saw her hiding behind a curtain and told the other Nazis who were going in, kind of Juden here, um, there are no Jews here. And they all left and he saved her. It, his action saved her life. But she was also saved by a reverend mother who, who, mm -hmm. who gave her the first Holy Communion and confirmation to hide the fact that she wasn't yeah. Jewish and suggested to her, yes, you can also be baptized if you wish. Now she was atheist. She had been brought up in an atheist family, Jewish by ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying to her in the beginning, when I was interviewing her, I said, you know, your Jewish faith. And she said, no, it's not my Jewish faith. I'm, I, I, I'm not a Jew by faith. I'm a Jew by ethnicity. Mm -hmm. I'm an atheist by, by 
belief system. So I, I found myself changing my way of phrasing it, um, mm. uh, uh, that the Nazis uh, killed the Jews because of their faith. They didn't. They killed the Jews because of their ethnicity. Um, yeah. Because many Jews were, just didn't believe in, yeah. in, a, in a God or a Yahweh. Um, and that so, seems to be, and you know, there are similarities there to modern Ireland. Yeah. That people who think they're Catholic, they probably think they're Catholic by ethnicity. Yeah. Because there's absolutely nothing. So they would have no problem in saying that they're Catholic. And being atheist or being agnostic, they would have absolutely no difficulty in that. Because to them, the Catholic bit is like the Jewish bit is cultural. It's culture. So they'll go, they'll go through the different things. I mean, for instance, we put on so many extra masses for Christmas on Christmas Eve. Forget about Christmas Day. Christmas Eve, we'll have about four masses in the year. And they'll all be full. You hope. And they'll be full of people. <laughs> well, oh, no, they will, I don't, I don't want to full. dash your hopes. Yeah. <laughs> but if they'll Michal be, Martin has his way. Oh, well, if Michal Martin's, we, we, have, we have plans laid for that. But normally... The, the churches are full. In fact, I actually put on mass in the community centre as well because um, one of the community centres because we just we've so many people. But that's because it's a cultural thing. Yeah. It's Christmas, so therefore you go to church. And yeah, 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 yeah. And even people who no, who never go from one uh, day to the next, Christmas Eve, they I have have a problem with the fact that the churches. St. John's Cathedral, where I'm, is my parish, and I adore it. And since I came from England, it was my mother's parish before that as well. But um, I just re regret the fact that we don't have midnight mass in St. John's, but we couldn't have midnight mass because you had people coming in who were rowdy inside the church, or you had that people was the case. who were drunk, and they walked yeah. up. Now, my attitude was, that's fine if they're drunk, most of the time they're just going to go up and fall into a seat or annoy yeah. the priest and the priest is usually able to cope with it. Yeah. Um, I mean, that did happen in the past. But, I mean, I brought, in most of the parishes I've been, except for this one, um, I brought back Midnight Mass. Mm -hmm. And at midnight. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I mean, yeah. We, never, we never had any problem because no. the drunks are all gone home. They're not interested because... In the past, everybody went to Mass, but nowadays, most people don't go to Mass. So th when they're drunk, they wouldn't even think of going up to the church. And even so if when I was do, in McCrum, you know, you kind, of, yeah. you kind of know them because their Limerick is, Limerick is, and yeah. Mitchellstown is even smaller. But um, Limerick is so small, you probably know them anyway to see them on the yeah. street. No, I mean, as I say, in all the parishes I brought back Midnight Mass, not once did I have trouble with drunks. I think Midnight Mass is sadly missed. Um, you know, I, I, lo I loved Midnight Mass. You'd always... Um, <laughs> I can remember one time myself and my friend, she ended up marrying a Muslim. And they, uh, they've been lived, married now over 30 years. Uh, 34 years she lived in Libya. Right. For 32 years and they moved back to Ireland a few years ago but um, and she's been my friend since we were four but we rocked up to mass one day up to communion and a, a, a message was sent back to my mother who was completely hyper about everything being right and neat and tidy and everything <laughs> we went up to communion and we had four different outfits on us including our first early <laughs> communion dresses we had the whole lot over us and we put about four different outfits on us. <laughs> we were playing dress up and we went down to St. John's Cathedral, marched to the top of the church, sat <laughs> at the front seat where we were told we should all sit at the front seat. And everyone was looking at us apparently. And the message anyway got back to our parents. We were murdered. <laughs> <laughs> We were murdered because we had the audacity. The priest didn't mind. He still gave us yeah. communion. If somebody else would have said something. Oh, Ma Myra Dwyer, do you realise the way you're, the state of your daughter going up to mass? <laughs> <laughs> and I was there, the an only child, and she was an only child. So you can imagine, like, she was obsessive compulsive about things. But the idea that I'd go up to communion with four different outfits on me, all different <laughs> sizes, lengths, 
uh, because we were playing dress up, but we were, we th so that's why I'd be very conscious. Doesn't matter really if a person is drunk, as long as they're not abusive. Yeah. Um, and priests are usually good. I, and it just, um, it just, it's just, it's just quite sad. But Father, I'm just looking at the photograph there of you as a little boy. Yes. And I'm just thinking, you know, people tend to look at the priest. Mm -hmm. Where am I pointing to there, the priest? Yes, you're the pointing the right collar. one. And I'm glad you wore the clarity collar because I find it difficult. I, I, I interviewed Father Ray uh, Kelly of oh, yeah, yeah. and He's lovely. He, it was a lovely interview. He, just, he was so, so, so nice. And I find it difficult to call priests by their first names. Even when they tell me, call me by first name. Father Willie Fitzmaurice, Canon Willie Fitzmaurice. I used to call him Canon, and he's, he'd squeeze my mm -hmm. hand really tight, like he hated being called Canon um, <laughs> because it made him feel old. Um, but I couldn't call him anything but Canon Fitzmaurice. And um, you know Canon Fitzmaurice? He played Harley. I don't. No, I'm not a GA man. God. Having grown up in Dublin, I didn't grow up a GA. I'm not GA either. But, <laughs> but when you look at the priest in the clerical collar and you almost think that they're not human, they're, they're, they're otherworldly, if you like, and that, that they're of a different time. And, you, and then you look at the child and you say, you see the human, you know, you couldn't but see the humanity in yeah. you know priests we tend, tended growing up to look at priests as if they were on another realm when they come into the classroom you were told to behave and they were i can always remember my priests in school coming in they were lovely father father collins and father ryan and uh, and they were just gentle souls but you think of them as being gods or demigods if you like and then you look at the little boy or you look at the little boy on the tractor and as somebody said you were driving a tractor there now you're driving a flock and you're driving a <laughs> parish i saw that i hope i drive the flock better than i drive the tractor <laughs> <laughs> they started you off young yeah well now that picture there of the boy i think that was when i was in saint louis in Dublin, we had the tradition that the boys went to the nuns for their first three years. Yeah, it was the so same. So I went to yeah. St. Louis uh, for babies, high babies, and first class. And that picture of me in the First Communion is of me outside Rathmines Church. With your mom and dad. Dublin. Mom and dad. And that picture on the tractor is down in County Clare. I knew uh, you Near a place there called no Cushing. There were no tractors in Dublin. yeah. yeah. And that picture of me in the as the priest, oh, that's yeah. actually on the Paris, the Paris um, Notre Dame de Paris pilgrimage to Notre Dame Chart. Um, I used to walk at Pentecost from Paris to Chartres. Wow! And that is at one of our breaks, and they made a mistake because if you look at my badge, they have both the French flag. And the the um, the Union Jack, oh, which should only be the Union Jack because I actually don't speak well. I do have a little bit of French, but I wouldn't have be fluent in French. That's what the flags are for, the languages that you're fluent in. Oh, so, okay. so anybody thinking there would think that you were British and uh, French. Yeah, that I, that I would be or fluent in French. And what was happening was an awful lot of them were coming up to confess very good in French. Idea, putting the yeah. countries. Except you'd be there with some countries wondering what country is that now? <laughs> Swahili. But that's uh, that 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 picture there of the priest. I mean, you should see that pilgrimage. It's absolutely fantastic. Can be anywhere depending on the time of year of Pentecost. Can be anywhere between ten thousand to twenty thousand people walking through the streets of Paris, down uh, the. Uh, the streets into the French countryside. And then it looks like something from medieval times in the evening because you have all these tents everywhere. We priests live, sleep in these big old military tents. There's about 14 of us in each tent and there are fires everywhere. And 
you have your food Amazing. and everything. It's absolutely fun. But the average age of the pilgrims is 21. Yes. Yes, I lecture, I lecture quite a bit now in Mary Immaculate College here in Limerick. And oh, yes. On the world religions and beliefs. Um, I, I did a module on um, uh, religion and human creativity and how you teach children about mm -hmm. different religions through different forms of creativity, either through dance, through music, through singing, through art, through whatever means. But um, uh, it's amazing. There, there's, a, a, there's a group of youngsters uh, um, they are set up for the last, I'd say, 10 years and they're 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 um they're trying to they're they're reviving if you like uh christianity and, and catholicism mm -hmm. and it's really refreshing to see i'm trying to think of the name of the group now but they're um, and they meet up regularly for for kind of pilgrimages if you like and for yeah. weekends uh, of, of, of 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 prayer and and healing and that um but every year for Holocaust Memorial Day, I speak at the Catholic University in Lille, uh, France. I don't speak fluent oh, yeah. French either, but I have to. There's a wonderful professor there. She was my external examiner for my doctorate, and she's Professor Cathy LeBlanc. And her grandfather right. was a Russian um, uh, resistance, member of the Russian resistance. And uh, uh, Cathy has written quite uh, uh, substantially about the Holocaust and and um, she I've, I've gone over there and I'm publishing with her you know and and that but uh, she amazing amazing work but getting back to the Irish and the I suppose and anti-semitism it's amazing how much are the Catholicism and uh, Judaism it's amazing how many Catholics and Catholic priests and Catholic nuns and um, clergy within the Vatican. Uh, it's amazing the amount of work they did, Le not least yeah. Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty um, yeah. to and, and other priests um, who, who who gave their lives in, in order to save their Jewish neighbours. Yeah, yeah, and to. Uh to try and save as many Jews as possible in the city of Rome itself. In the, in and I mean, I always laugh because when you're brought to Castel Gandolfo on a tour, mm. you see you're shown the rooms that would have been the Pope's and this was Pope yeah. Sonso's bedroom. But that was actually where so many children were born because he hid them all in the Castel Gandolfo. Yeah. Because technically... It's Vatican territory, Vatican so therefore territory. the Germans couldn't come onto it. Yeah, it's outside. Yeah. But I mean, Monsignor Hugh of Flaherty oh. saved 5,000, um, uh, Jew mostly Jewish, um, but yeah. also um, British, because he set up the Rome line. And once, yeah. they could, once they could get into the Vatican square, the Vat they were part of the Vatican City, which has yeah. its own government, as you know. Uh, its own government and its own law. It's outside of Rome, so they, as it. you say, the Nazis couldn't couldn't touch them. And families were dotted all over Rome and the Vatican City, and even in houses next door to Nazi headquarters. Yeah, yeah. And they said. And what was interesting was that the there was guards on the. You know, there's a white line between That's the Vatican right. and yeah, and the Palatine Guard, as they were called, they they were since disbanded. They would be marching up and down with their rifles and their plum. <laughs> they hadn't a bullet in the rifles. There no. was absolutely nothing to have stopped the Germans if they had realised of going into the Vatican. They were never because nobody had any. Yeah, nobody had any guns to stop them. The Germans would have tried, so they would have certainly done it if they thought that it wouldn't have created a diplomatic um, yeah. crisis. And I mean, I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Scarlet and the Black with Greg. I did, Black, yeah, I remember it. It's, yeah. on, it's on the Catholic website called Gloria. And it's yeah. on the, the full video is up there if you're typing uh, Gloria. But um, it's, it, you know, that kind of epitomizes what happened you know with 
Gregory Peck, a.k.a. Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty, walking up and down the line, the white yeah. line <laughs> between him and, um, uh, and uh, you know, and, and death, basically, had he stepped beyond that white line. Absolutely, he'd have been in occupied Italy. Yeah. Occupied Italy. It's, it's occupied uh, it, Italy. It's just... Did you ever think when you were that little boy, did you always want to be a priest? Was it something that was nagging at you all the time and that well, you tried to, tried to, to fight it? Um, there was something there all the time, all right. Now, I did, I was going to go into the Christian Brothers okay. when I did my intercert. Okay. But I was a year too young because, you see, I did my intercert at 15 and I did my leaving cert at 17. Well, so good. then... Yeah, so when I didn't go in, well, I was to wait a year because, you see, uh, to be a novice at that time, you, what used to happen was there was a place in Bray where you went to do your leaving cert. And then next door to that was the novitiate for the brothers. Yeah. But you see, I would have been too young to have gone into the novitiate since I was only 17. So Brother Cripps told me to wait a year, but I never did then apply. And then I always had a niggling about it. And uh, I wasn't satisfied with my work that I was doing, even though I was out of school for three years and I was working. And I had fabulous income and everything. I did, you know, a good life. And then I said, look, I'd better do this now. Uh, and just, and I actually had written off to Sandhurst in England to be an officer in the army. Yeah. Right, yeah. And the, and then I told them to put it on hold because I had to go and prove that I had no vocation, that this was a childish thing and that I would be back to them in a year. <laughs> and look at me now. <laughs> could you not have done the two? I know it would have been. I know the priesthood takes, it, it's seven years, isn't it? Six years. Seven, seven years. years. Seven yeah. years. Yeah. And it's a long time. And, you know, people say, um, oh, priests, um, they, they talk about priests and the right to marry and things like that um, and you say um, in one sense you think it's probably right that people priests have the choice if they want to marry or if they don't but then on the other hand you think okay it's not as if a priest goes in today and decides I'm going to be a priest and tomorrow or next month or in a year's time they're trapped for the rest of their lives not being yeah. able to marry you have six years and in that six years you have a lot of a yeah. lot of contemplation a lot of a lot of soul searching a lot of deciding is this really for me is this yeah. what i want I mean, what are your views uh, father i would mix celibacy? i mix a lot i i mix a lot with them um, i have friends who are eastern catholics and um eastern orthodox mm. I mean, give you an example now. There's, there's an Eastern, there's a, I think he's Greek, Greek Orthodox Mass every week in Belfast, right? But that's the only time they see their priest. Yeah. Because he's a married man. Yeah. So during Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, he's driving a lorry around the north of Ireland. <laughs> yeah. Because that's his income. That's how he gets paid. He, he doesn't get paid enough. I can't to, see him driving a lorry around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Now, I also have a good friend of mine who's a Ukrainian Catholic priest, Ukrainian Greek Catholic. But again, like, he can't just be put into any old parish because there wouldn't be enough income. No, but he's you got a wife and he has two children. As well, and moving yeah, he's them got from two parish children to parish. and he's moving around. So he's always had to be careful. Now, he's gone into, the, you see, the funny thing is the Ukraine allows for married priests. But at the moment, they have a vocation crisis because they don't have enough celibate priests because in most of their parishes, they need a celibate because the people just can't afford a married priest. Yeah. I get, you know, at the end of the day, after tax uh, and PRSI, I probably end up with about 27,000. Yeah. Now that's fine for a year. That's fine for a single man who I don't have any major expenses Stop. but you couldn't live you no, you couldn't live on that, live on that if you were a married man with children and i mean when i say to people when the people say to me oh there should be married priests i say 
do you put 50 euros a week in the basket? Oh, God, no. Well, I said, you're going to have to if you want to marry a priest because basically that's it. But even still, I mean, think about it. 27 euro, 27,000. That by um, 52, um, it's about 200 and something euros a week. Yeah. There's no way you it's could. not a grave, it's not a huge amount. And out of that, you have your you ESB. You couldn't have, you couldn't, have, uh, um, you couldn't uh, keep a, a family on that. No, and now remember, we've got our ESB, our, like everybody else, our water, our car, petrol, insurance. I mean, and my you need car, a car insurance. If you're called yeah. out, somebody dying. I mean, my car insurance, we have a diocesan policy, and my car insurance last year was something outrageous, like 700 even though I've never had a crash and I've been driving for years. So, but those people, you know, the other thing is that if you're married, you haven't got time to, like, you've got the divine office. You have to pray your divine office every day. You got to spend time with, in prayer. Because first and foremost, you see, I think part of the problem in Ireland is that for years, we saw our priests as social workers. They built schools, they built hospitals, they built clinics, they built this, they built that. They were all the time doing, 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 doing. They were in charge of the GAA. They were in charge of this, they were in charge of that. Forget it. Our first duty is to God. So we need time, first of all, to say the divine office. And we need time to spend in prayer because we must be men of prayer first and foremost yeah the only way i can talk about god is if i spend time with god no man can give what he hasn't got and i think people forget about that that they just see the priest as a function so you come and you say the sacraments and that's it but there's a whole other side of the priesthood of being that we must be men of prayer of sacrifice and we must have that time to spend with God. And that's in, in most religions that you look at. If you look at Buddhism and you look at Buddhist monks, mm -hmm. who um, for the most part are, are, are give themselves up totally to meditation and to contemplation. Yep. Um, and the same in, in Islam and the same in Judaism, you have, you have, you have rabbis. And, and I mean, going back to uh, it, it, the thought just occurred to me when you talked about two presidents um, be, in your school being from being uh, your school producing two presidents, Herzog. Yeah. And Herzog was in actual fact um, considered and called the IRA's um, uh, yeah, rabbi. The Sinn Féin rabbi. Sinn Féin rabbi, I should say, not IRA, but the Sinn Féin rabbi. And, um, and, and then you look at situations where, where you know, you, you say, shouldn't that bring people closer together or, 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 or sh shouldn't there be some kind of uh, understanding beyond this effort to boycott, boycott, boycott? Oh, yeah. I mean, think of it. The first religious leader in this country to accept the Republic was Rabbi Herzog. The Catholic Church hadn't accepted the Republic. The Church of Ireland hadn't. The Methodists hadn't. The Presbyterians hadn't. The only one that came out immediately and said he recognized the Republic, and this is when we were still not independent. Yeah, this was the only one that came out in 1918, 18, when 19. the first oil met, met. He said, that's it. We accept the Republic. No other religious group did that. And I think, you know, they talk about, oh, yeah, they took the Catholic Church out of the Constitution. But they also took the Jews. There used to be, it wasn't just about the Catholic Church. It was about everything. And so there was a protocol there that you had the Catholic Archbishop of Dublin, when you had any function, the Catholic Archbishop of Dublin, the Church of Ireland Archbishop of Dublin, and the Chief Rabbi. That's right. And only yeah. then came the Methodist and the Presbyterians. Now that we didn't have gone. any, we didn't have any uh, any people from the Islamic yeah. faith here at the time. And the and the only constitution in the West that mentioned the Jews was the old Irish Constitution. Yeah. It mentioned the special place of the Catholic Church, but also mentioned the Anglicans and the Jewish people. Mm. 
and it was the only Western constitution that mentioned them. And I mean, as I said before, there's that, like I say the Eucharistic prayer number one every day, the first Eucharistic prayer, because that is the Roman rite in its essence. And every day we pray that the sacrifice will be accepted as once you accepted the gifts of your servant, Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and your priest Melchizedek. And that always reminds us that Melchizedek. Jesus was yeah. born a Jew and died a Jew. Yeah. He, he was born a Jew, he died a Jew, and when he rose from the dead again, he was still a Jew. He was still a and Jew. And that our faith, our faith, the Jews are our elder brothers. They are, and this and is what I can't. This is what I can't understand because if you look at, in its simplest form, if you look at Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, we're three Abrahamic religions. We yeah. each of us are monotheic religions, and each of us believe in, 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 in um, Abraham. And, yeah. uh, and, and especially, we're, 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 if you like, we're brothers from yeah. uh, another father or another mother, yeah. uh, sort of uh, especially... half brothers, half sisters. We should be closer. And, 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 and efforts to tear us apart even further doesn't yeah. sit well with me. I've never felt comfortable with alienating people rather than sitting down and mm. talking to them because so much can be sorted out. Whether you like um, the, um, a, a president or whether you like a political party or whatever, any efforts at bringing together um, political dialogue has to be, has to be um, acknowledged and respected. And the efforts... And that's why... that that, that have been made at this present moment to bring mm -hmm. uh, um, um, Muslim, the Muslim co countries and, the Jew, uh, and Israel together has to be and that's why, good. And that's thing. why if you, if you notice what they're calling the accord between Bahrain and UAE, yeah. they're called the Abraham Accords. The Abraham, that's to remind exactly. them, yeah, To remind them that, that they both have the same root and that uh, even Muhammad himself had a special place for the Jews. And, you know, that's what needs to be done. They need to recognize that they're the same Jewish people that were there since Muhammad. And since Muhammad um, treated them with respect, they're now realizing they have to do as well. Yeah. But we also have to, you see, it's very, what people don't realize is it's very easy to blame people and say, oh, it's the Jews, and it's the this, and it's that. And it's the Palestinians, and, and especially, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know, it's not. It's, it's very easy to do that because what you you see, what you're doing there is you're a, you're, get, you're, you're naming you're something, something and you're up. saying that's it, yeah, and you're saying you're not seeing the human person. You know, I am secure in my Catholic faith. When I'm preaching, I never have to preach against another religion. I don't need to. For me, the fullness of the Catholic faith absolutely, is so beautiful absolutely. that I don't need to. No. But when you get these people who start going down the road about anti-Semitism and the Jews are doing this and the Jews are doing that, immediately sets off alarm bells because they're not comfortable in their own faith. In their own faith. And they have to find somebody to blame for that. And what they do then is just, and you but see there it always has to be There always has to be an other. And uh, yeah. everyone seems to people seem to find someone is always the other the chinese it's are like, are another um the yeah. the mexicans are an other the 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 the, the muslims are an other and the jews yeah. are an other to 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 different people why why can't we realize that we are just we have this it is probably the fact that we are other to somebody that connects us yeah, but also you know we are connected we, by otherness there's a lot of insecurity at the moment, not just with co-virus, but with everything, with Brexit, with the breaking up. And it, when people are insecure, that's when they start looking at y you, um, you and me. Yeah. Instead of us. Us. Like, instead of seeing us all together. I mean, the problems that we have today affect all of us. Yeah. You know, they affect not just Catholics, not just Jews, not just Muslims, but everybody and anything. And therefore, we should be finding, you know, that doesn't say, you know, 
okay, I agree with everything the Muslims say. No, of course I don't. And I don't agree with everything the Jewish religion. But no. that's not what we're dealing about. We're talking about setting up a world. You don't agree with everything that it's your safe. brothers and sisters would say. Exactly, yeah. What they're exactly. your family. Yeah. And so what we want to do, though, you're still family and you still look after each other. You can't and you fight. Still, even though your brothers and sisters fight, you still look after each other. You know, we might fight between ourselves, but anybody outside of that, then, oh, yeah, how dare you? <laughs> that, I, mean, I know. You, that's you, how we have you to see it. Yeah. And you, you, and know, you see, you often just, we don't. You can't just stop talking to your brothers and sisters. Well, you can, yeah. but it's not a healthy relationship. No. Dial we would never have peace in this country, in Northern Ireland, had it not been for the likes of people like John Hume, Mo yeah. Molan. I mean, Mo Molan, I always uh, extol her virtues because this was a woman, a Protestant English woman, head of a, uh, if you like, of a, of a government who took the opportunity and took the brave step of going into Lankesh and going in and talking mm -hmm with Republican prisoners and with um, Unionist prisoners and finding out what can I do to help? Yeah. What can I do to bridge the divide that's there between you? How can I get you together and, 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 and bring about peace? And they respected her for it. I mean, I think there is nothing worse. It's very easy to turn around and say, or we'll boycott fruit and vegetables that come from yeah. that country. What good is and that? I, if you've got to, that's what, you've got to boycott the medical, the medical yeah. treatment. And that's that why, come. that's what, that's what I get so annoyed. Yeah. I mean, that's why I get so annoyed with Sinn Féin. Because you see, Sinn Féin go, oh, attack Israel and all that. And I, Sinn, Sinn Féin, Féin should so, be. So there's many other, uh, apart from I know, but Fine Gael, Sinn, like they, if you, if they you all go, want to I know, but if them. you go down, let's face it, if you go down a national street in the north of Ireland, you'll find Palestinian flags. Yeah. And there, there's always been that connection between the PLO and the IRA. Yes. And that's why I get, I mean... Okay, I, I know there is anti-Jewishness and anti-Semitism among the other parties, but it really gets me with Sinn Féin because they have come through a process where they were boycotted, where That's they were exactly left out it. in the cold, That's exactly where they were it. condemned, yeah. where they yeah. were everything. Yeah. And, they, and only when all that stopped did peace come to the North. And it came so much so that even though there are elements still there on both sides, that want to continue, they've taken the oxygen out of it. They took so they, that it doesn't. They, they, yeah. And like I, my, I would say to Sinn Fein is stop this nonsense of Hezbollah and PLO and all that, and go over to Israel and say, look, this is how we brought peace. We sat down with our That's enemies. Exactly it. You can't sit down at. You can't set about peace. There's no way we yeah. can actually sit down at a negotiation table if. On one hand, we're boycotting a country, yeah. and on, we're taking sides basically. And on a, at yeah. an, a, and in another extreme, we're looking to try and be the peace brokers. We yeah. have to we have to lead by example and say the Palestinian people are suffering, but they're suffering uh, because of their because of an unelected, if you like, government. Of their own people, yeah. Of their own people. I mean, the amount of money that goes into just Gaza alone. The amount of money. I mean, if they stopped building those blooming tunnels and put that money into the people. People. That's the, but you see, they chose not to. And They've but chosen there, but again it, it and again and again. There are many who are trying. There are many oh, yeah. uh, Palestinians and there are many, there are, you know, there are, there's goodwill on both sides. It's just not coming from the higher authority. No. And, and, and until that happens and until people realize there is going to be no peace there, without somebody taking the steps. And I think the Abraham Accord is a we'll huge, 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 gigantic. And according, and I have no reason not to believe, I have to say, I have no reason not to believe Donald Trump because he has got two, three Arab countries uh, sitting down with or uh, b building good relationships with Israel, where flights are coming in now 
from these countries yeah. from Bahrain into Israel and Israeli flights are going into Bahrain the other way. We never thought we'd see that. And so, the, and maybe it's because he has got a Jewish son-in-law and, and Jewish grandchildren and a, a Jewish and daughter. Also, but, and also the fact that he has no real interest in the Middle East because he's not, he's not America, is now, America is now self-sufficient in fuel with fracking and all that. And you see, the others realize that. The Arabs realize that. Their, their oil isn't going to keep them forever. That they have a choice now. Do they work together with the likes of Israel that's high tech, that has everything it needs, and work with them? Or do they allow this difficulty to continue to separate them? And they realize that they need to come together for their own goods. Because no longer will America... I mean, we don't know what happens with Joe Biden, but to be honest, I don't see Joe Biden, you know, going to be there too long. I'd say if he gets elected, he'll I be there for the maximum two done. years. I think what's been done to the man, because you can see the cognitive decline. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at videos of, of Joe Biden uh, a few years ago and you look at the sprightly, um, yeah, no, no, uh, he's, I mean, I couldn't man. believe it. I couldn't, I couldn't believe that they allowed him to go forward. How is his I mean, wife, who's a not. medical doctor, allowing it? Presume she's a medical power. doctor. They get power, they power, yeah. We'll do anything for power, won't we? Power is an aphrodisiac, but, yeah. but, we'll but, do anything. but, but it's cruel. It's, it's hard, it's very Absolutely. hard to watch. And you hear people laughing at him and, and you, 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 at times you laugh yourself at things he says, but the human side of you says... No, I just, I'm just afraid now any time... Your, your, your uncle, um, just, or your father withering yeah. away in front of you, uh, where yeah, he's no, grasping for words. That's Any time I see a video, a video coming up of him, I, I don't switch it on because I say to myself, no, this isn't right. You know? It's just... So I'm, just, and then you see what happens is uh, your woman Howard, or, or not, what's her name? I forget the name. The voice Kamala person Harris. will be the one. No, she's very I mean, left wing, and I I yeah. would consider myself. I was all I always thought I was left wing, and now I but I am actually very <laughs> central. I can see yes. both sides of every. I suppose because my background was Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, um, mm. English, Irish. Uh, I was born in England um, with an Irish mother and very Irish mother, very English father. So you see both sides of, of every argument. So I'd be right in the center and I don't, and I try not, and the more so people hate on someone, the more I like them or the more I yeah. try to find good in them. And I don't know what it is. Well, what I, find, what I find amazing about Trump is, now, I, I mean, I don't, his personality doesn't do anything for me. <laughs> but what I do find amazing is that he will be the first American president in over 50 years not to send not troops to to war. into somebody else's. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you never hear that in RTE. Never. never. And why is never. that not a set? He is the first. I say it all the time when people say to me, you, you don't dislike Trump. I don't dislike Trump. I don't have it. I mean, I don't. I would have been a Bernie Sanders supporter when the, during the last elections. It would have been never anyone but Hillary for me if I was yeah. in America, because she would have gone to war with within a, a day of her. Absolutely, election. I mean. Um, whereas Trump is the only president I've ever seen of any country uh, that has not wanted to go into, that has just yeah. wanted to look after the people that are there in America get their economy up and get them back to work and pull out um, soldiers and bring them back home to their families and not be and killing, there was, killing people. There was some not spat, nothing. there was some spat with China, I forget which, but that they were going to, they wanted to send in a missile and he looked at it. And it's the first time I ever heard the leader of any country saying, well, he said it would have killed about 300 people. And he said, I thought that would have been disproportionate for what had happened. And I said to myself, well, I've never heard anybody ever say that before. No, I mean, he's not. He's, he's an absolute. And no, but it, it, I, the media has an awful lot to do with portraying somebody. Um, uh, absolutely. In, in a light that they don't want. That's not the chosen one. 
if you like. The look, at, look, at, look, at, look at how they portrayed Benedict, Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict they were all was the vilified time trying to, all because of yeah, the game. All the time, yeah. And then actually, it turns out that, look, when he went to England and the English people met him for the first time, they loved him. Even though the BBC had done its best to make him out to be all Nazi because loving was, and all that. All because he was a member of the Hitler Youth, which yeah. at that time Everybody. was compulsory. There yeah, were even yeah. Jewish children. Il Ilsa Kuhn was her name, and yeah. um, she um, she was a member of the Hitler Youth, the H Hitler Young Mädel, and she was Jewish, part Jewish. She was yeah. a Michelin second degree, um, which would have under Nazi, under the 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 um, under the um, Nazi laws. Um, she would have been considered the same as if she was fully Jewish because her yeah. father was Jewish or one or her mm -hmm. grandmother, if your grandmother, I would have been a Michelin second degree um, under the, the racial laws. Um, if you had any Jewish blood at all in you. But the easiest thing for families to do if the child didn't, if the child was blonde or light haired, was to put them into these organizations so that nobody realized who they yeah. were. So she went the whole war without realizing that her parents split up because her father was Jewish and her mother was Protestant and it was the only way to keep the attention away from them. They got back together after the war, but right. um, you know, it, 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 people were forced, children were forced to join these organizations and Benedict defected from it. He, 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 he ran yeah. away from it, but they don't talk about that. Not at all doesn't fit in with their narrative. Do you know, and I just wish news media, especially in America, was more unbiased and show well, and, and <laughs> honest. I find it very funny at the moment. Um, there's a, an advertisement on RTE about watching RT News for the truth. And I said, RT News wouldn't know the truth if it bit them it in the backside. <laughs> <laughs> well, Father, do you know something? This has gone over the hour. I could have Way talked over to you. Now. No, I could have talked to you forever. I mean, it was, I, I thought, you know, that, um, you know, I, I, you're, you're the third priest I've, I've, I've actually had on um, uh, to talk on the show. Uh, Father Ray Kelly was, was one of them. And it was very, very different. It was about his, his sing. Are you a singer at all? No. I do, but I'd always have to have a book with me. I did, when I was in seminary, we had a CD with Noreen Irene. Oh, okay. We were the, we were the background for uh, her. her we, it was a, a chant, on a Gregorian chant. And then we also appeared at the time. You might remember, after Riverdance, there was another um, thing, I forget what it was called, and Noreen Irene. Irene and Brian Kennedy sang in it. And Anuna. And then the monks, no, uh, the monks of Glenstall were the background. Fabulous. And what had happened was the monks couldn't go on the tour because, of course, they're monks. <laughs> so we were in the seminary and we got called up. So we had to go around on the tour around the country. So I'd, I sang with Kennedy, whatever his name is, and, and Noreen Irene. Yeah, Brian Kennedy. That's my, my, Brian Kennedy, that's my claim to fame. But do you, <laughs> before we go, what do you think of, because uh, I love it, I mean, okay, my mum was obviously brought up pre-Vatican pre too, um, and, um, and when she died, when mum died, because she was fluent Irish, I had her mass in Latin, English, and Irish. And I had a friend who hadn't been to mass in a long, long time. He didn't even go in when his own dad for the funeral, he stayed outside the door. But he came in for my mum's and he said it was the first time he felt he was at mass because of the music, because the music mm -hmm. was Latin, it was English, it was Irish, and because of the Gregorian chants and 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 um, the tried it was almost tridentine, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think? Do you think there's a space? Do you think that um, uh, it was better when people went in and they they spent the time praying, even if they didn't understand um, the Latin, that it was yeah, almost meditative. Do you think that well, tridentine I, was better than when I started? When I started out twenty three years ago, there was one old priest in um, 
uh, in a church in Cork that said the traditional mass. And he said at 6.30 in the morning. It was in the um, missionary African missions church there opposite the CUH. And um, I, I actually say the old at mass as well. Uh, that pilgrimage that you see me at the background, that's all we say at that. We say that outside and we say a Latin mass every morning. Yeah. So really before the pilgrimage, before the pilgrimage starts, uh, from about four o'clock in the morning, you have the priests going down to the altars, various altars, saying their private mass. And so I have been saying the tr traditional Latin mass. Um, in fact, at one stage, I was the only priest in Munster saying the traditional Latin mass because after the father died in the the church in um, opposite CUH. I used to say it then once a month in St. Um, Peter and Paul's in Cork. I said it a few times in uh, Tralee. I used to go up to Limerick and say it once a month in St. Patrick's on the old Dublin Road. That's only two minutes from my house. Yeah, well, I used to go up and say once a month. Oh, no. I, I said Mass, uh, when, when the Latin Mass started in Knock, I used to go up to Knock to say it. And when Father, another priest who used to say the Mass in Wexford died, when he died, I used to go to Wexford yeah. once a month to say the Mass. So I was everywhere. But now you see all the younger clergy. You rent a priest. I've said, yeah, and all the younger clergy now know how to say the Latin Mass. And I've done myself out of a job. Oh, so no, but it's the brilliant. Thing is, it just feels there's a the the, the Jesuits near um, h here in Limerick. There's young priests. They're French. Yeah, the Institute of Christ the King. Hold on there for a moment. It's getting dark. It's getting a bit dark here. Well, I tell um, you a story about yeah, that. No, church. They're, they're very good, and they the, and yeah. the, and they were bringing in a lot of crowds into the church because it was in Latin. People, yeah. I think, I tell people you, are craving a tradition. And, yeah, I tell and you, and of, that that church, when the Jesuits were moving out, uh, I was the chaplain to the Latin Mass Association of Ireland, and we had arranged through Pather Lawless, the president we had arranged over 1 million to buy that church from the Jesuits. They wouldn't sell it to us. They sold it to a developer for a million and a half. Then the developer came and sent me a letter to say that he was going to turn the church into a kind of gymnasium and that, and put in a pool, a swimming pool. And oh. then, but he would leave the sanctuary area and he would have these big doors. And on a Sunday, what he would do is he would cover the pool and open up the doors and we could have the traditional mass. But that wasn't accepted. I said no. And then Bishop Murray was your bishop at the yeah. time. And I met him and I told him about the Institute of Christ the King that they wanted to come in to Limerick. And I brought Monsignor Schmidt of the Institute up to meet Bishop Murray. And um, then they eventually came in and they had a house outside um, Limerick. And then they bought, that church went up for sale again, but only for a couple of hundred thousand at this stage. I think it was 250,000 and they were able to buy it. Um, now, when I said mass in St. Patrick's, I had a congregation of 200. So I don't know how many they have now in, in Limerick. Um, the and then, shot more or less. Yeah, and in St. Patrick's, in St. Peter and Paul's Church in Cork, I said the Mass there once a month until their new priest came and he learned how to say the Mass. And now they have daily and Sunday Mass in Latin. I think, it's, then, I think it's, very, it's very meditative, it's very spiritual. And, uh, you know, I mean, and it, it, it's almost. It's as you say, the Gregorian chant. It's very like the call to prayer when in yeah. in, in, in Islam, and it's very like the the, the music that's uh, play uh, sung by rabbis in in uh, the um, in the, Shema, the Shema Israel, you know. And and it, there's 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 a 
there's a similarity again in the in, yeah. in that music, mostly um, a cappella, um, and and I just think it, it's just it's so gorgeous to listen to. Yeah. Now, I was also for many years um, involved with the Scout to Europe, a Catholic scouting group in France, and uh, again. We had a, a, a pilgrimage to Vézelay every year. And, you know, the basilica would be filled with 2,000 young men between the age of 18 and 24. But to hear a church full oh, of young men singing. singing chant is unbelievable. Oh, it's just, it's just like I played now for a, a children, or students, in Mary Immaculate, you know, they're all studying to be primary teachers or secondary yeah. teachers. And I've interviewed enough heard. of them. <laughs> Yeah, and they'd never heard um, yeah. call to prayer. And uh, because yeah. I was teaching a little bit about everyone's religion, I played the call to prayer, prayer. And one girl was walking in after being out of the bathroom and she came in and she kind of just whizzed around and she said, what is that? And I said, that's the call to prayer, the Islamic call to prayer. They pray, they, they, when I was in Mor um, Morocco, one time we'd be wake, woken up at five in the morning or half four in the morning to, to it. But after a few right. minutes, it became just so relaxing. And, and, and the same, as I say, when I listen to um, Jerusalem of Gold, when I listen to that being, or the Shema, Shema Israel, um, and that, that kind of just chant, it's just, and, and when you listen to the Gregorian chant, it's just, they're all just so addictive. Yeah. So, so relaxing. And I just think that there's room once a week for a Tridentine Mass. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It can be easily done. Do you know, I be. mean, because people just... Now, the problem is, out. in Ireland, a lot of people who go to Tridentine Mass would prefer not to have any music. They want what they call a low mass. Yeah. Um, but um, most places, we used to have a little bit of singing. We used to get when them to sing to a bit. you go to and you don't speak French, you're not going to understand what the priest is saying. And if you go to Germany and you don't speak German or Italy or wherever. Um, so when you have a Tridentine mass, you've got a universal, if you like, language. It's almost I mean, like yeah, I mean, Esperanto. it's a problem. I mean, it's a problem even for priests because I remember being on holidays in Madrid and I went down to the local Opus Dei church. They yeah. have a parish there in Madrid. And I said, of all places, I said, um, they'll allow me to say a private mass. But actually, no, he said, no, oh, no, you, you can come and can celebrate at 7.30. But I said, I don't speak Spanish. Well, that's okay. And I said to myself, well, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. <laughs> um, you, know, you know, say mass in a language you don't know. Um, I was cut out once. I was on holidays in Andorra, and Andorra they speak both um, French and, well, I thought it was Spanish, but it was Catalan. Catalan, yeah. Catalan. So um, I had learned. The hearings are Catalan. Yeah, having gone back to, you know, I'd gone back and learned how to say Mass in Spanish. And I said, that's grand. I can say Mass in French, and I can say Mass in Spanish. I'm covered until I went up on the altar with the priest concelebrating with him and we opened the book and I realised this isn't Spanish, this is Catalan. I hadn't a clue what it was about. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, it's funny. I was in Spain on holidays and I was asked to do a reading and that's when I realised I seriously need glasses. I rocked up to the, the, up to the um, uh, lectern and I, I stood be behind it and I couldn't see a, 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 a word on the page, not a word and, a, and panic, <laughs> pa panic set in and I had to actually sit down. I couldn't, it yes. was the first time and I, I'm a reader in, the, in, in St. John's Cathedral and it was the first time I realised my eyesight was gone. And now I can't, I can't see you for, I, I, I have gone through this whole interview and you were a complete blur. <laughs> it's probably a blessing in disguise that I can't see myself because, um, 
I, I just feel a bit. But anyway, Father, thank you so much. You're very welcome. It was an absolute, I have to say, it was probably one of my favourite interviews. All right. Because you could talk about so anything. Much. It was such a while. Anything wise. and everything. Before you go, why, yeah. why the um, poppies? And, uh, oh. and oh, well, as I'm from it, Dublin, you see, obviously it's I have, World War yeah, I. I've loads, I've loads of relatives. Uh, my, both my grandfathers fought. My um, grandfather, Blake, my mother's grandfather was wounded in Ipe, uh, so he was always paralyzed. Her two granduncles were Royal Dublin Fusiliers, but funny enough, they survived the war and died from the flu in 1920. Wow. My um, grandfather, Burke, was in the Royal Navy, and this will make you laugh. His uncle, with the same name, no, his uncle Bert, was in the GPO with Padraig Pierce. Yeah, that happened with my granduncle Jack. He was in the old IRA, and his brother was in the British Army. And yeah. they were both born in Liverpool, and neither of the two of them ever spoke to each other to the day they died. Again, God. Because, mm -hmm. it, wasn't it sad? And um, Uncle Jack was buried with the tricolour over his coffin, and his brother was yeah. buried with the British. But my, my, my own great-grandfather, my parents are buried with him, was blown up on the Leinster during World War One. Right, yeah. When the Leinster okay. was torpedoed. Now we don't know whether his his body was in the grave or whether they just put the yeah, stone that's there. Just in, yeah. Marked the. Uh, mark. I also had. A, I also had. I think he's a great granduncle. Yes, he must have been my mother's granduncle, and he was a Chelsea pensioner. Oh. But in fact, he'd been he had been a Kilmainham pensioner. He had lived in the Royal Hospital Kilmainham until 1922, and then they were transferred to Chelsea, the Royal wow. Hospital Chelsea. And he died in the Royal Hospital Chelsea in 1956. That's a great order. And the only time, yeah, oh, they're fantastic. And fantastic. the only time he was home was during the Second World War. He lived in the um, Ivy Trust Hostel in Dublin during the Second World War. So now... Well, you're just a mind of a place. <laughs> you just, I mean, we could talk forever about uh, different things. And I'm sure if I, an hour and a half, near enough, that I'd say. Have that long? Huh? Well, they don't call me Gabby for nothing. <laughs> and there you were saying you didn't uh, kiss the Blarney. You didn't need to. <laughs> I don't need to. <laughs> Neither of us did. Um, but anyway, thank you, Father. You're very welcome. Listen, God bless you. And bye God bless.